We've covered a lot of different choices today. Our culture is obsessed with choices, aren't we? We're obsessed not just with choices, but having plenty to choose from, right? I heard a number this week says that, there, that on a daily basis that we make around 35,000 different decisions every day. And that number seems really high, 35,000 decisions. But most of our decisions are, are unprocessed. Most, most of the time what we're doing is we're, we're making decisions, we're doing things without even really thinking about it, not, not cognitively working through it. Think through the first few minutes of your day. And the alarm goes off. Do you hit snooze or do you not? That's a decision, right? And then at what point are you going to get up out of bed or go to the bathroom? When are you going to brush your teeth or not? That's a decision, right? What are you going to wear? Are you going to put what pants or what shirt? What are you going to eat for breakfast? By the time you leave your home, you're already in the hundreds of decisions that you've made. And that number 35,000, I think that number sounds really familiar for those of us who live in Frankfurt. Because if you wanted to go out to eat, and if you wanted to go eat at a Mexican restaurant, I think that there's about a, a 1 in 35,000 choice to make there, right? We live in this culture that has adopted, I think, the slogan of Burger King, the whole have it your way, because we love having choices and, and being able to make things the way that we want it and, and we make them the way that we want them to be. The problem is we're just not very good at it. Not very good at making decisions. I think we actually struggle. And that matters. It's a big deal because the quality of our decisions determines the quality of our lives. That's a quote from a guy named Craig Groeschel. The quality of our decisions determines the quality of our lives. And he says that there's three enemies to good decision making. There's three things that are working against us in our ability to make good decisions. Uh, the first one is that oftentimes we feel overwhelmed. And if you think about it in the context of 35,000 decisions a day, that makes a little bit of sense, doesn't it? As the day goes, we actually develop what's called decision fatigue. And as the volume of decisions increases, the quality of our decision-making decreases. And it's not just that we're overwhelmed. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes we're afraid. It, it intervenes or interferes with our ability to make good decisions. And it leads to indecision, which is a decision, right? And it's not just those two things, it's also our emotions. We become too emotional, our emotions step in and they begin to overrule logic or wisdom or good decision making. So here's the deal. According to Groeschel, what we do is we will analyze unimportant decisions <laughs> and then we will make important decisions on some sort of a whim. We'll use all sorts of energy uh, and creativity to, to work through decisions that don't really matter, but then when things get really big, uh, things that really do matter, we just kind of throw our hands up, we go with our gut, and then we just kind of move on. And that's a problem. Because we make our decisions or we make our choices, but then our choices make us, don't they? Our decisions make us. And the quality of our decisions determines the quality of our lives. Groeschel says that the biggest decisions, the most important decisions, should be made ahead of time. He calls it a pre-decision. That the biggest, most important choices that you will ever make should not be made in the moment. They should be made ahead of time. And if you take those decisions seriously, then you're going to find them impacting all of the other decisions. It's going to cut down on decisions that I have to make later. When I'm, when I'm solid, when I'm set on my biggest life decisions, the other things start to become easier to decide. It's going to cut out the feeling of being overwhelmed. This removes the fear from the equation. It takes the emotion out of it. The challenge for us, though, I think, is paying close attention to that biggest decision. And then constantly reaffirming that decision. It's something that I think we struggle with because we love having options. The ability to choose, I think, is actually something that God gave us in the very beginning. I think we could call this free will, right? He gave us the ability to choose, and it may be the biggest gift that God gives us. It's one of the things that, that God gives us that I think makes us distinctively human. 
It's one of the things that separates us from animals. But it might also be the most dangerous gift that God gives us. Because when we have the right to choose, when we have the right to choose, we can choose what is right or what is wrong. We have the opportunity to choose God or not God. And that's the biggest, most important decision, right? The biggest predecision. Do you choose God or not God? And what happens if we get it wrong? There's tons of examples that we can pull from Scripture that are what I would call a tipping point. It's moments when a person or a group of people have to make a choice, some sort of a big, important decision. It's the kind of predecision that's going to impact every other decision for the rest of their lives. And it starts in the very beginning. In the very beginning, in the book of Genesis, God creates the garden that Adam and Eve live in. And in this garden, there's lots of diversity. There's lots of variety. There's lots of freedom for Adam and Eve to, to choose whenever it's time to eat. They have a wide range of choices, much different than Frankfurt, right? But every time they eat, Every time they eat, there's this great abundance and that diversity to choose from, but there's one big decision that is lingering over the top of all of their decisions. They really have one big choice. It's to obey or not to obey. That's it. Because there's one tree that God has said he has a special rule about, and he says that this is the tree that you don't eat from. There's one tree. But they have the right they can if they want to. It's one really big choice. And Adam and Eve are put in a position where they have to make a choice. It's God's way or their way. They have to choose between God's kingdom or some other kingdom. And from the beginning, from the very beginning, humanity has always had a choice between two kingdoms. And after Adam and Eve, they make their choice and the world goes the way that it does, but the option doesn't go away. Every human ever since has had to make that same choice. So sometime later, we come across the story of a guy named Joshua. Joshua is a young man who kind of becomes Moses' right hand in leading the nation of Israel. And he's got this promise to him. In fact, he becomes the leader of Israel once Moses dies. He's the one who leads Israel into the promised land across the river. And he, he really does a wonderful job. He's a great leader. Uh, he leads the nation of Israel really well. And towards the end of his life, he's, he's approaching death. He knows that his time leading Israel is near. He finds himself giving this, this speech to the nation of Israel, this challenge, this, this encouragement to them. And you're going to be familiar with one of the lines, but I want you to see the larger context that leads up to the well-known line. It's in Joshua 24. He says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. This is a choice thing. This is, this is him encouraging them. You need to make a choice, and this is the choice that you should make. This is what you need to do. And he says, throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. It's the same kind of a tone, that there's that's more of that choice language. That he's imploring them to make the right choice. You're in this position. You have to make a choice. Make the right choice. He goes on. He says, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living now. He's telling them you have a choice. You have to make a choice between these kingdoms. You have to choose which side you're going to be on. And then the famous line that you probably know, you may even have this in your home somewhere, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. When Joshua says this to the nation of Israel, they have a collective response. It's kind of cool. This response, we're told, they said together, we will serve the Lord. And then Joshua goes on and he begins teaching and telling them some more stuff and encouraging them. And they respond back with, we will serve the Lord. It's a cool moment. It's a powerful story. And it's all about choice. Joshua, this leader of Israel, he's simplifying the choice for the people. It's either the one true God or it's fake God's. It's all about either God's kingdom or your pursuit of any other kingdom. And there's plenty to choose from, aren't there? And we have the same choice to make. Several centuries later, you, you see the nation of Israel is, is not doing so well. 
The same nation that stood before Joshua and said, we will serve the Lord. It's now generations later and they're known as a people who have not served the Lord. Instead, they've they found new gods. In fact, they fall in love with these new gods wherever they're at. And we find this story in 1 Kings chapter 18 about a prophet named Elijah. And he speaks to the nation of Israel in a similar way that we see Joshua speaking. And he says, how long will you waver between two opinions? That's choice language. How long are you going to waver? How long are you going to go back and forth? Elijah says, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, that's this false God that they'd begun to worship. He said, if Baal's God, then follow him. And then one of the more haunting things that you're going to read in Scripture is said after this. This same nation that centuries before responded to a passionate speech from a passionate leader named Joshua who responded with, we will serve the Lord, is now experiencing the same moment with a guy named Elijah who's leading them and challenging them. And the very next line that you're going to read from 1 Kings says, the people said nothing. People said nothing. It should haunt you. It's the same response that I think some people still make today maybe even some of you in this room. That should haunt us a little bit. But it leads to one of the coolest stories, <laughs> one of the wildest stories of the Old Testament. Elijah challenges hundreds of prophets of this false god, Baal, to a duel. It's weird. <laughs> You're not going to read this in other places in the Bible. It's weird. He tells them, I want you to build an altar. So they both build these separate altars with rock and they put wood up on top and they lay a sacrifice, a dead animal across the top. And then Elijah stops them and says, the God, the one true God, the real God is going to light the altar himself, not us. Keep your matches at home. And so he says, I tell you what, why don't you guys go first? And so they do. These prophets of Baal begin doing their work, uh, worshiping and, and, and doing whatever actions they think would, would convince their God, this Baal, to respond by lighting his own sacrifice. It's weird. Elijah sits to the side and mocks him, like makes fun of him, like he eggs him on. He's laughing. He's, it's, just, it's, hilarious. it's weird. It doesn't fit with most other stories you read in the Bible. And then they've had enough. Elijah tells them to sit down. <laughs> he gets up and he's a little bit of a showman. He looks at his, at, his, uh, at his altar and he realizes it's too dry, which is weird. They're in a drought. There's no rain. It hasn't been raining in ages. It's dry. And he looks at this. He's like, is it going to be too easy to light? I don't want anyone to think that this was an accident. And so he, he calls for water and they begin dumping absurd amounts of water over the top of of this altar, the opposite of what you would do if you want to light something on fire. And it's a drought. It's hard to get water, and they're wasting water, an absurd amount of water being dumped. In fact, we're told that the ground that was dry, that hadn't seen water in ages, takes on so much water that they're dumping over that it becomes so saturated that this ground begins holding water. It's soaked. And then Elijah gives one of the shortest little prayers you're going to find in the Bible. The Ben Webb translation is something along the lines of, God, do your thing. And then he does. Like this lightning just comes out of the sky and it, and it strikes this altar and it consumes the altar, the entire thing. Not just the sacrifice, but the wood, the stone, the water, all of it consumed. And then one of the most duh statements in the Bible. We saw one of the most haunting now one of the most, duh. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. You think? I bet they did. This story is all about choice. You have this Elijah, this, this prophet from Israel, and he's, he's simplifying the choice for the people of God. It's either the one true God or it's fake gods. It's either the true God or fake gods. It's either God's kingdom or or any other kingdom. It's very simple. Now there's a struggle between the nation of Israel all throughout the Old Testament and these false gods from the nations that were around them. And it's seen through a lot of the different leaders, through the prophets, through the judges, through the kings. There's, there's so many different leaders who lead Israel through this issue of having these false gods. It's just a constant cycle. And so when Jesus shows up in the New Testament, 
maybe there's a little bit of expectation that he would say some of the same things, that he's, that he's going to have a lot to say about these false gods, about these surrounding nations. But when you look in the Gospels, you can't find it. It's not there. This, this Jesus speaking to the nation of Israel, coming after this long line of people who spoke against these false gods, Jesus shows up and he doesn't say a word about it. Instead, Jesus challenges us with the false gods that we let inhabit our hearts. And he reveals something that the Old Testament was saying. They were trying to convey, they were trying to understand, but the Israelites missed it. The Israelites had become hypersensitive about the engraved images, the engraved idols that they would make and that they could put on display in these places of worship. They thought God was against that kind of thing and they became hypersensitive about the places of worship for these false gods and and whatever form or fashion that that looked like. And so they thought that God was against those temples of those false gods, those places where worship took place. And they were right, kind of. God is against those things, those idols and those places of worship. But it's bigger than our outward expressions of worship. The nation of Israel thought that if they just avoided those places and they were doing the right thing. As a nation, they weren't, they weren't good at it. They, they thought that that's all they had to do, but they weren't even good at it. They weren't good at avoiding worshiping false gods. But then Jesus shows up and he reveals that it isn't even about what we put on our shelf or where we worship these false gods. The issue is much closer to us. It's our hearts. It's a choice that we make, just like the Israelites face in the Old Testament. Let me show you where Jesus says this. It starts in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This seems pretty innocuous at first. This teaching from Jesus is in the place of the Bible that we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. It's a three-chapter section, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's kind of this collection of the things that Jesus would teach and it covers all sorts of different ideas and it covers all sorts of different areas of life but there is a pattern that emerges from Jesus's teaching and what he does is he challenges our obsession with outward actions and instead he challenges us to look deeper into the heart and so the Sermon on the Mount is is that place where you're gonna find Jesus saying stuff like this like hey we know that it's wrong to murder right everyone's like yeah that's wrong and most of us, you know, are actually pretty good at that. Like most of us don't, don't kill people. That's great. But then Jesus says, I want to talk to you about your heart. Is there any anger in there? And the people who hear this, they, they thought they were good with God because they'd avoided murdering someone. They'd controlled this outward expression. But now after listening to Jesus, they find themselves guilty. Guilty. Because it's not about what I do out here. It's, it's what's going on in here. Jesus goes on and he talks about adultery. And that's a behavior that most of us agree is bad. But Jesus says, Jesus says, hey, we're, we're really good at that outward behavior and appearance kind of stuff. What about the heart? What's going on in there? Is there any lust in there? And people who are hearing this, they, they thought they were good with God because they hadn't acted on what was in their heart, but, but now they find themselves guilty. Jesus has this big idea. What's going on in the, in the heart is bigger than the behavior that we work to control. And while Jesus doesn't address false gods directly by those words or by those names, this is where Jesus begins to get at the deeper issue of our false gods. Worship is connected to our hearts. It's a heart issue. And what happens is we're going we're gonna to let our hearts wander towards whatever it is that we treasure, whether it's good or bad. And where our hearts go, our worship follows, whether that's good or whether that's bad. And so from this verse from Jesus, where he tells us that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, what Jesus is saying is that you have a choice. You can pursue the true God or you can pursue the treasures of this world. You can pursue God's kingdom or you can pursue any other kingdom. A few verses later, Jesus says no one can serve two masters. Either he's going to hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
Jesus doesn't just talk about these false gods in a generic sense. Now he's going to actually show us what one looks like, one that exists. And he calls it master. Because whatever we call master is going to become our God. Whatever masters us, controls us, whatever we put in the throne is the thing that dictates everything else in our life. Whatever we make king has authority. And it seems like at first, like this is a different section of teaching. That this is some completely different idea that Jesus is talking about, but it's the same section. It's the same idea. It's just three verses later. What's going on in our heart is a big deal. And Jesus says one of the false gods our hearts are going to treasure is money. You think that's true? You think our culture has any issue with worshiping money? You may say that you don't worship money, but you do. And I do. We don't have like little shrines in our home to money that that we've built that we go and we worship, right? But I bet if we looked at the walls in your house, we'll see evidence of your worship of money. You may not go to a temple and and worship money, but, but I bet we could see some things if we walked through your garage and we can see what you wear and we can look at your social media. And there's evidence all around us of how much we worship money. And again, we, we can look and say, well, we don't have these engraved images. We don't go to these places of worship, but that's not what this is about. We don't worship false gods like the people of the Old Testament, but our hearts, our hearts say otherwise. This verse is all about choice. Jesus says you can pursue the true God or you can pursue money. You can't do both. You can't have two masters. You're going to love one and you're going to hate the other. You can pursue the true God or you can pursue money. You can be all about God's kingdom or you can crown anything else as king. A few verses later, towards the end of chapter 6, verse 33, you've already seen it a couple times today. Jesus says this very simple little line, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. This isn't about engraved idols This isn't about temples for fake gods. This isn't about those kinds of things. This is about the various things that our hearts treasure. Stuff like money. For you, maybe it's relationships. I've I've seen too many parents who've put their children on some sort of a pedestal that, that they worship their children, and it's not healthy for the child, and it's not healthy for the heart of the parent. It's not good, Right? You you remove God from where he needs to be. I've seen husbands do this with wives and wives do this with husbands. I've seen people do this with friendships. They are all false gods. I've seen hearts that treasure politics. People who look at the political landscape that we currently live in and they believe that voting the right way or electing the right people is going to fix the world or enact the right movements within our culture. And that somehow political figures will save our country and save our world. That is a false God. There's so many more. My list, I would include, I would include, uh, oh man, I lost some slot. <laughs> I would include entertainment, power, or sex. There's a guy named John Stone Street. He gave a better list than I did because they all start with S. And so he says sex, state, self, science, stuff, the things that we turn into idols are false gods. And I think that's a pretty accurate list. And our hearts treasure a lot of things, and a lot of things become our gods. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your heart is, there your worship will be also. We have a choice. Just like Adam and Eve had a choice, and just like Joshua and the Israelites had a choice, just like Elijah and the prophets of Baal had a choice. It's that big decision. It's that most important decision. It's that pre-decision that Groeschel talks about. And it's going to impact all the other decisions that come after it. That we can make Jesus the one that we treasure and our hearts are going to follow or we can fill the blank in with anything else, absolutely anything else. We can choose God's kingdom or literally any other kingdom. Before we close out, I want to share with you just Two quick principles about choice. As we talk about making decisions about these choices, I want you to to see something here. The first principle is this. Not choosing is not an option. Not choosing is not an option. In fact, you've already made a choice. 
As we said earlier, you don't have to make an intentional choice for it to be a choice. It's like, it's like that 35,000 decisions we make every single day. Most of them are not intentional, but they are still choices, still decisions that you are making. And I need you to hear this. If you don't choose Jesus, if you don't choose God's kingdom, that is still a choice. And if you think that you can just kind of live adjacent to Jesus or God's kingdom, you need to know you're going to naturally drift away. Your heart will drift away and choose anything else. If you don't intentionally choose Jesus, your heart will choose for you. It's why Joshua has to speak to the Israelites in that tipping point and say, choose this day who you're going to serve because he's going to remind them that if you don't intentionally choose God's kingdom, you're not going to serve it on accident. It's why Elijah challenges the Israelites in his tipping point and says, how long will you waver? Because if you don't intentionally choose God, you're going to drift to anything else. You will not find yourself accidentally worshiping God. It's why Jesus offers us a tipping point when he says no one can serve two masters. And then he says, seek first his kingdom because it's not gonna happen on accident. It requires you to seek. It requires you to make an intentional choice. And if you don't choose God, you're going to choose something else. Not choosing is not an option. There's a second principle as well. Choosing isn't forever un until it is. <laughs> right? Choosing isn't forever until it is, meaning that you can change your choice if you still have breath and heartbeat. In fact, if you can hear me speaking, you're eligible, right? You can change your choice. And that's really good news if you haven't chosen Jesus. It's good news to find out that you can change your mind, right? You can make intentional decisions in place of the previous decisions that you've made. And if you haven't intentionally decided to pursue Jesus and you've found yourself just kind of drifting and, and moving whichever direction within this world, which, you know, that is a, that's a choice, you have the ability to change that choice. Even right now that this could be your tipping point, that you can change your trajectory right here. You can change your direction. You can make that big decision and change what your life looks like. That's also bad news if you're a person who believes that your previous choice that you made is permanent. There's some of you who've made a decision for Jesus at some point in your life and you haven't done much with it since and you think that because you made some decision in the past that naturally that's just where you're going to stay. The reality is our hearts drift. And when we drift, we don't find ourselves accidentally in worship to God. We drift away. We wander towards other treasures. It's why I think this concept of a pre-decision is so impactful that the biggest, most important decision of your life have to be made in an intentional kind of a way and they have to be repeated daily. Making Jesus your Savior is the biggest decision you're ever going to make, but it requires daily reaffirming. And if you do, it's going to reinforce every other decision you make. It's going to make your pursuit of God's kingdom higher than any pursuit of any other kingdom. It's going to look like seeking Him first. It's going to look like making your heart treasure what is most important instead of your heart wandering towards any other treasure. Andy Stanley puts it this way. He says, the decisions we make matter because they determine our direction. And that's important because our direction determines our destiny. When you, when you leave the church here in just a few moments and you turn left out of the parking lot, you get out to Versailles Highway and you turn left, you're going to find yourself driving towards the interstate. And when you get to the interstate, you have a choice to make. You can go right or you can go left, right? And depending on where you want to go is going to determine the decision that you need to make, whether that's right or whether that's left. And you have to take that decision uh, seriously. You have to be serious about the choice that you make because you won't accidentally end up where you want to be. If you turn left and you head east, you can want to go to Louisville all day long you're going to find yourself in Lexington. And it doesn't, it doesn't ever wrap back around. That, that, that interstate going east is not ever going to come back to Louisville. You're never going to get there. Your decision determines your direction, doesn't it? And our direction determines our destiny. You need to check your heart. You need to let this be a tipping point for you. 
In the same way that Joshua is going to look and say, decide today who you will serve. In the same way that Elijah is going to look to his nation to say, how long are you going to waver? In the same way that Jesus is going to say, seek first his kingdom and no one can serve two masters. That's what I'm calling you to today. There's two kingdoms. Which are you pursuing? Which kingdom do you want to belong to? Do you want to be about what God's doing in this world? Or are you in it for yourself? Are you trying to fulfill any other kingdom? And because there's two kingdoms, that means that there's two kings. Which king are you allegiant to? Is it Jesus or is it something else? Is it yourself? Have you chosen God's kingdom or have you chosen anything else? Have you wondered? Have you made Jesus supreme? I want to invite you to do that today if you've not made that decision or maybe you need to reaffirm that's a decision that you need to be serious about. We're going to sing a song here together. I'll be sitting in the front row. I'd love to have a conversation with you about what it looks like to follow Jesus and to make him the king of your life. It's the most important decision you'll ever make and it will impact, should impact, every other decision that you make. Maybe you want to talk afterwards. Doc will be back in the connections room. I'll be hanging out up front. We have an elder in a prayer room over your right shoulders back to the back. I would love to pray with you as well. But if you feel something within the Spirit, if you feel like for you this is that tipping point, don't miss it. Take advantage of the opportunity. Let's worship our God.